Welcome to a new week and a new psalm. We're in Psalm 82 today, so turn in your Bibles, grab your Bibles, and turn there with me. Um, uh, the title, uh, let me show you in my Bible here, point out a couple things today. Uh, first of all, just as a reminder, in my Bible, I'm looking at an NASB here, a New American Standard Bible. Um, let's see. Let's see the... Um, can't see the, this is a 1995 update, and I don't see who the publisher of this is. I use this in a Bible software called Logos, and uh, that italicized title there is added by the editors. It's added not by the Holy Spirit. It's not part of the inerrant, infallible, uh, inspired, and all-sufficient Word of God. It's just a guide. It's a note from the editors saying what this psalm is about. Down here, I've told you before, this is in the original text. Uh, this is in the inspired word of God, this title, this small title here. I get asked sometimes about these little letters and things. Well, the, here's a letter A, for example, in my Bible, if you can see that. Let me highlight that for you. Now let me just highlight the word. You can see next to the word there the letter A. Well, in my Bible... Uh, that indicates that there's a cross-reference to another Bible verse that uh, would illuminate this or add to it or say something similar. Uh, the number here is a little different. Again, uh, might be different in your Bible. But your, uh, the number indicates perhaps a, um, an alternative translation or the editor wants you to know literally what that says. So in this case, that number one says that it literally means, the note says, literally means the congregation of God. So they've translated the congregation of God as his own congregation. So I'd encourage you, as I do sometimes uh, periodically, <clears throat> take your Bible and look at those pages that you usually skip over, the introduction and sometimes you'll see a section called Translator's Notes or Publisher's Notes. And it'll explain what all these things are in the Bible, what all these little <coughs> superscript letters and numbers are and what they mean. And they even tell you something about all the cross-references that may be in the center column or at the bottom of the page. It'll tell you how to un understand those. So I encourage you to do that. Help you become a better student of your of the word and a better user of the tool that you have in your hand. Psalm 82, let's get to the psalm. I uh, call this injustice is temporary. Injustice is temporary. And um, the summary, uh, I make these summaries and usually to make the summary, and you could do the same thing as you study various things in the Bible down to a paragraph level, really. Uh, but a chapter, a whole book, you can just ask yourself two questions and answer them. What, what is the author talking about? And the other question is, what are they saying about what they're talking about? You answer those two questions, you can come up with a summary of the whole, the whole psalm in this case, or a paragraph, or a whole book of the a chapter, or a whole book of the Bible. So in this case, just demonstrate a little bit, what's he talking about? As you go through the psalm, you'll see he's talking about dishonest and unjust judges. And what's he saying about what he's talking about? He says these unjust judges, dishonest judges, are going to ultimately answer to the God who is the just judge. So I take those two answers together and turn them into a summary that says the unjust judges will be found out and judged by God. That's the summary of what Asaph is saying here. Read carefully uh, the psalm. You have two speakers here, uh, Asaph in verse 1, and Asaph announces God's arrival. And then in verses 2 through 7, God announces judgment. So we have two announcements here, and then it closes in verse 8 for Asaph's prayer for justice. Um, let me point out a couple things. Um, in Asaph's announcement in verse 1, he's picturing God kind of arriving uh, to intercede for his gathered people. He's, he's standing in his own congregation, among his own people, 
this is a um, judicial scene, let's say, as if God has come into the courtroom. And as they do in courtrooms, the bailiff says, all rise. And the judge takes his place and has his seat, and then the rest of the courtroom can take their seats as well. And that's essentially, I think, what Asaph is doing here. He's announcing that God has arrived, and he's there to bring justice for his people. Verses 2 through 7, then, God is going to turn, as you read this, and address the unjust judges. And again, it's, it's as if he's in a law court, Right? He begins with the accusation of the wrongdoing. Then he points out their negligence and their complaint about their betrayal. And then when we get to verse 7, his sentence is passed on them. I wanted to point out to you something that uh, can be some sometimes, you know, make you pull your hair out a little bit and make you wonder what's going on. This verse says, this is God speaking. I said you are gods, and all of you are the sons of the Most High. Well, what's he saying here? Is he saying that he is sharing his deity? That he has taken men and made them gods, as our Mormon uh, heretics would try to tell us? Well, let me say that uh, what's going on here is he's telling them that you are gods, in the context of this psalm, in the sense that they have a, a godlike authority and godlike responsibility to bring justice and judge. That's what he's saying here. Later on in God's revelation, Jesus is going to come back and quote this verse. In John 10 34, he quotes this verse when he's having a clash with the Jews who are accusing him of blasphemy because they understand clearly he is blaming, claiming to be God. And John, Jesus goes to this verse. And what he's doing there, I'd encourage you, uh, let me read that for you, but I encourage you to study it on your own in light of what I'm saying and see if it doesn't make sense. Jesus says, has it not been written in your law, I said you are God's? Well, what he's doing here is he's reasoning with the Jews and he's reasoning from lesser, mere men are called gods in this psalm, to the greater, that Jesus, who is clearly set apart by God the Father and sent by him as his miracles attest to over and over again, uh, he's greater, isn't he? Uh, doesn't this prove his claim to be God? That's the reasoning that Jesus is going here. But in this psalm, it's not in any way a confirmation that God makes men gods. He gives them godlike responsibilities, and he expects them to live up to it. Finally, at the end, Asaph prays for justice. And let's go to our highlight verse, verse 3. Vindicate the weak and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and destitute. By now, you're well aware of parallelism and how they in the parallel phrases show up and inform each other. And that's what we see here with vindicate and to do justice. To vindicate, not a word we use a lot. Vindicate means to clear someone of blame or suspicion. And to do justice is to, you know, act impartially according to the law. And ideally, that's what a judge does, isn't it? Uh, ideally, a judge vindicates the, the innocent by doing justice. Um, we see how tragic that is when uh, the, that is not followed, when we have something like an O.J. Simpson trial and uh, the uh, judge, uh, he is found innocent even though the predominant evidence seemed to point to his guilt. We find it today in law courts that are run by people who are got their hand out looking for their palm to be greased, a bribe. They don't do justice and the weak, the fatherless, the afflicted and destitute, uh, those who can't afford the bribe become victims. So earthly judges, this is saying, according to God, should judge without partiality. 
shouldn't favor the poor, but they shouldn't penalize them. They shouldn't favor the rich, but also they shouldn't penalize them. They judge without partiality and, and apply the law evenly. But as you know and I know, in the world we live in, that often does not happen. And what happens is that the weak and vulnerable are often the victims. So how do we apply this? It's kind of a somber thought, but a true thought. How do we apply this? Well, as long as we are in a sin-saturated world, um, justice is going to remain an ideal, not a reality. Now, for you and I, brothers and sisters, and I, I would say everyone, uh, we should use every legal means that we have available to us to seek fairness in the courts. But at the same time, we also need to have confidence that Jesus himself is ultimately the one who's going to set things right. We see that at the end of John or uh, Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus assembles the nations before him and he enters into judgment with them. We see it in Revelation chapter 20, where thrones are set up and thrones uh, are arrayed for judgment that's coming. We see it in Psalm, in uh, Revelation chapter 22, the great white throne judgment of God. So we live in an unjust world. We should work for justice, but know that true justice comes with the coming of Jesus. He will fulfill this. He will vindicate the weak and the fatherless and do justice to the afflicted and destitute. So again, as we have been doing, let's join with Asaph in prayer. The first century believers close this out. Arise, Lord, judge the earth. What we can do today is again, join those first century believers and pray, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, bring righteousness and judgment to a sin-sick earth. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Have a great week. Uh, head out today with God's word in your heart. God bless you.